Yeah, how's it going? You you playing at the weekend? Yeah, yeah. We we're down there in one in the neighbourhood big weekender, which was really good. That was a really nice hot day. Um, uh, it was cool. And then we had a gig in Darwin, a little festival, the in the city centre there, which was a really cool little festival as well. So, aye, it was a good weekend. A uh, nice one, yeah. Still sort of recovering from it a little bit, maybe. <laughs> It's a bit longer recovery time these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair play. Whereabouts are you in Dundee? No, I mean, I'm in Glasgow. I lived okay. here. Lived here for almost 10 years now. I, before that, I was down in London, so. Ah, fair play. Um, yeah, I guess, like, just <laughs> get out of the way kind of thing. Um, obviously, what happened, I live in Manchester, but I wasn't at the gig. Um you just what happened? Obviously, you've got over it as a band. Like, what 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 went on from your kind of perspective? Ah, uh, I mean, like the video speaks for itself, really, on that one. I don't know how much I could add to that. One thing I will say, though, for the record, is that I was totally up for doing the London show. The next day, it wasn't me that cancelled the London show. Uh, Taking more than a couple of fly digs for for me to put like. Uh, Feel out for the fans, so but I but I all good gigs have been done. Yeah, well, yeah. Bridge, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I guess like I guess it's a typical thing. I think one of one of the tweets like described you as you know like brothers. I guess I guess that's, I guess that's what goes on with families. I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm an only child. Yeah, same <laughs> here. To be fair, yeah. <laughs> All right, then, mate. Um, yeah, like just taking it back a bit. Um, did have Kyle on a few years ago, but just to fill in some of the blanks, like he was saying um, about how you used to like enter t- talent contests and all that. Um, but at uh, one point, he said like uh, you lot got trades at some point or something. Did you all start working? Yeah, yeah. When we all left school, we all sort of got different trades and stuff. And then it was like, we'd done like, like one proper gig with like our own material. Like we were a cover band before. And that was like, we entered the talent show at school. That's how we started the cover band. And then we all went and sort of went our separate ways, got trades and stuff. And then we got back together to do our sort of like original material. I think we had like sort of one good gig and we all quit our jobs. Like, and then just, <laughs> <laughs> like, and then just uh, started focusing on the band. But I, yeah, yeah, I was a joiner's labourer and was a joiner's apprentice for a little while. Okay. Uh, Pete was joiner as well. I, think, I can't remember, but I, I. Fair enough. Is that pretty useful at any point? Ago, like a long time ago, like, <laughs> seventeen or something was like the last time they sort of done a proper day shift. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, like the the Pete Docherty involvement. Um, I've read like a few different things. Something like one story was that you were busking to him outside. Another one was like that you got actually got in the venue. What what actually happened? Well, we're outside. We're waiting outside uh, where a CD or we're, we're EP. We had an EP out at the time on uh, one manager's local label that was called Two Thumbs, and so we were waiting outside with that uh, uh, to give it to Pete. Um, and I think we did, we, at that time we always tra- we always had a guitar kicking about, like someone was carrying a guitar or was doing, like we, so I imagine there probably was a guitar there, but we weren't like busking for money. We were probably just having a jam outside waiting. Um, but I I gave Pete the CD, and uh, he took us on the tour bus. It was the first time I'd been on a tour bus, and I was like, whoa, this is well cool. Uh, and then he listened to the CD like while I was sitting in the back lounge with him, and I was like. It was probably one of the most nervous things I've ever had in my life. It was like, like obviously a huge fan at the time, and also like just when people like, like that you respect their music, listening to your music, but then he was like, he was into it, so he was like, I you could play the night, and I was no way. So I went took took me up the stairs in Fat Sam's, and up to the promoter's office, and it was like these guys are playing, like sort them out with passes. And the promoter was like, nah, man, like, there's too many. There was already, like, five bands on the bill or something. And I was kind of like, 
oh, well, this is the end of that like kind of thing. But he he pulled all oh, these guys are playing and I'm no playing trick. And I was like, holy shit, this guy's serious. Like, and uh, eventually, so we got. He said like, you can go on for twenty minutes, like as soon as the doors open. So literally, as soon as the doors open, we fired up. There was nobody there, and like, but we'd put out on MySpace and all that at the time. So like, people knew from Dundee, and they were all like running into catch us and that. I was. Just, it was epic, like, uh, it's a good night. And, yeah, that's quality, yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. I was like, still can't really believe it, to be honest. Like, you know, it was lucky. And uh, but then he followed up as well. I mean, we got after that. We, the next time we played with him was in the Rhythm Factory, which was like, again, like CBGBs or something. I thought at that time, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, I'd heard about it, but I'd never been at that. And to go there the first time and support Baby Shambles was amazing. And then it turned out that that was a test of to see if we were allowed to do the UK tour. So, because they had their sort of, their agents and all that there. And then we got the UK tour, which was even more amazing. Eh? That was our first ever tour. So Yeah, yeah. That. That's it. It's, yeah, do, do we like, we just kind of like bang up for taking opportunities kind of thing, even though you were a bit nervous maybe in some moments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I seem nervous, but we were quite cocky, like, when we were, <laughs> yeah. when we were younger, but, like, that actual moment on the tour bus, I was sort of quaking at, like, but... Um, yeah, was it just you as well, I suppose, if you're by yourself, it's a bit intense. Uh, uh, yeah. But it was cool. I mean, it was cool. It made, it, it, him and the band made us feel a welcome in that, like, but... Surreal experience, definitely, like... Um, yeah, yeah. It was cool. And, yeah, we've done, we done loads of tours with Shambles, Libertines and all that off the back of that. They've really sort of helped us out over the years and that. And it's been cool because we were, like, I was kind of saying, like, I like started playing the guitar because of Oasis, but I started, like, writing songs because of the Libertines kind of thing or something. I don't know, is that kind of vibe? Like, it was, like, sort of proper sort of kick up the arse, like, again, like, sort of, this, it wasn't, like, it was, uh, it was really inspirational to us. So it was, like, really surreal to sort of be playing with them and all that. Mm. Well, I can imagine it's the same for me. Like, uh, we're a similar age, I think. And um, yeah, like he definitely ins- inspired me to pick up a guitar. Yeah. Definitely, if it made you feel like you could do it, just write a song. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't the sort of the one that seemed very accessible. So it just like they were also just, like speaking to people online and stuff. It kind of broke that sort of rock star crowd barrier thing, kind of thing. It was all, it all seemed very cool. Which I sort of gave the impression that it's all right to go up and give them a CD and ask if they can get a gig, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you had that, you had like, um, like a big following of people from Dundee, didn't you, that used to, used to follow you around kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, we were quite lucky straight off the bat. We had like sort of quite a, a decent following in Dundee that sort of grew quite rapidly because we, we kept... We, we, we we never stuck to just doing like gigs in like the, the sort of trendy venues in the town centre. Like it was a our manager at the time's idea. The, he sort of he said like we'll do a world tour of Dundee and like put it in the paper that you're doing a world tour of Dundee. And we went to like all the pubs in like the sort of housing schemes that like bands never go to and stuff and done all that and that that, that really helped. He was quite innovative, innovative in coming up with stuff like sort of like to get us in the local papers and all that. Oh, okay. Um, and it just, it just grew from there pretty rapidly. Yeah, bit lucky. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of songwriting, obviously, with it's just like mainly you and Kyle, like, did you just have that kind of connection from early on type thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we fitted quite well, I thought, like, sort of, sort of quite contrasting styles almost, but together it kind of came, the view kind of thing, like he was really sort of melodic and I was more sort of thrashy, going on sort of punk side of things and he liked it. And I just kind of, that was kind of the view sound. Oh well. Um, Peter's been writing songs recently, the last couple of albums, Pete's been writing some songs, but the, the first few was on me and Kyle and I. All right, cool. And um, yeah, I just <laughs> didn't ask Kyle about the, um story behind Wasted Little DJs it's obviously quite a self-explanatory I suppose in the lyrics but um, yeah it was what's the story behind that? Uh, well the Wasted Little DJs um, is Carlene and Charlene the, Charlene's my fiance oh, right, okay. uh, Carlene's married to Rennie keyboard player and there were our mates at the time that were just uh, doing like like uh, just sort of playing indie indie disco stuff and that and 
Yeah. So wrote a song about them and uh, yeah. And we were, we were stuck on the chorus for, for, for ages and ages and ages. And then Kyle, so I, I remember he came up for me like stupid early in the morning one time. I was like, which is unusual for us at that time. And he was like, I've got it, I've got it, like knocking on the door. And he like changed the chorus to double Dutch. And I was like, that was kind of when it became <laughs> what it is, which is quite bizarre. And it's like it's sort of quite a unique bit. Uh, no, it's a nice song, yeah. Still one of, still one of my favorites to play, like. Mm. Yeah, it's great. And um, yeah, would you just where would you write song? Would you write songs anywhere with Kyle if you both had a guitar? Like, would you come up with ideas wherever you were, type of thing? Yeah, yeah. Quite often we would come up with an initial idea separately and bring it into the practice room and sort of all work on it together, like the whole band. You know what I mean? Mm. A bit of input. You know what I'm For example. At the end of St. Jean's, it really speeds up quite a lot and goes into that sort of mad reprise bit at the end. That was our pizza idea, like, kind of thing. So, uh, but yeah, okay, cool. we used to rehearse every day. We had like, a, initially, we had a practice room in a pub called The Bay View, which was owned by Kyle's uncle. And that's where we got the name The View. And then we got chucked out of there because. We never packed away our gear before. He had a christening on one Sunday and we were practicing late Saturday night and forgot and left all our gear out. And then like the christening showed up and I was, I was like, all oh, these guitars and everything. Like, <laughs> uh, so when we showed up to practice on the Sunday night, all our stuff was in the car park and that was the end of that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I read on, on Wikipedia, it says you got kicked out of there because uh, Kyle was riding a scooter on the bar, but that must have been a bit of a, a that bit was, story. Uh, that was in a, a, a media arms and legs type story yeah it was actually a micro scooter do you know like the ones with the little wheels like we were just loving a laugh one day i think it was like was it even? <laughs> and before by the time it got to the papers it was like a lambrea <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess you i guess you won't rule it out with you guys though no it was quite typical at the time like things were getting sort of blown out of proportion but it was good practice in there it was definitely that was what that was what we sort of where we were done a lot of the sort of early work because we were done a few of our first gigs as well uh, okay what just get everyone in there type thing yeah and then, so we had to find another place and um, so we ended up playing and doing the same thing in a room up the stairs in the dog house in the town so that that became our rehearsal room and we used to just go there and practice every day because by what you already said we'd all quit our jobs and stuff by this time so yeah I actually um I actually came to one of your practice rooms with the Paddingtons. Uh, I think that was 2007. I wonder where that was. That was the Bay Horse. Oh, okay, uh, right, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. And, then, and they, we went to practice in the Bay Horse because I, I went up with the guys and done uh, All Right in the Morning. Yeah, yeah. One of my favourite songs. And then we went to so practice in the Bay Horse and then they were playing in the doghouse that night, I think. I think it was the doghouse they were playing that night. Might have been, def- yeah, I just remember it being in Dundee. I, don't, I can't remember yeah. where. Yeah. I thought it might have been Fat Sam's, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe. But it's good night, definitely, yeah. <laughs> Aye. Is there a bit of a story about you going to watch them before you were in a band as well? Oh, yeah, I used to go, I used to travel around a lot to see the Paddington's. Like, so, so did all my mates. Like, we were right in the Paddington's. We used to go through Edinburgh, Glasgow, further afield to see them. But yeah, in Dundee, when, when we went and seen them in Dundee, I climbed on top of the speakers and uh, they'd just stop the gig until I got down. <laughs> <laughs> but I got excited. They're one of my favourite bands still are. Yes, yeah, yeah. Still love listening to that first album, to be fair. Right. Um, and, and then, yeah, you, see, you mentioned management. Like, How quickly was that involved? Really quickly, really quickly. Uh, so our manager ended up coming down to the very first gig um, in the doghouse. And he pretty much sort of put the feelers out then. And that was pretty much when the relationship started with Grant. We managed this all the way through the first album up until the second album. Um, and he, he he was a big part. Like he was he was really keen. Like he was like he believed in the band a lot. Like and uh, he like he bought was a van. He bought was like a tote tile of van, and I mean, thinking like I mean, saying I think I was I don't know, Peter Kyle or I was like, this guy's absolutely lost the plot. Man. He, <laughs> he just spent like 
1500 quid on a van like <laughs> he's never going to see that money again and, and he but he said like he was like someday soon guys we're going to get a phone to somebody in london and we're going to get down there super quick and pretty much about two weeks after that james endicott phoned and was like get down to london from the club night and he was like told you and we all jumped in the van and went down but yeah so from very very early on we had management then yeah like how surreal is it when you is it number six you are on the call list or something 2006 it must have been weird <laughs> and great. Yeah, that was pretty weird. That was pretty funny. Wasn't expecting that one. So it was pretty cool. Eh? And some cool companies like Carl and Ove was like next to me and eh, Faris and the Horrors and stuff. Eh? That was pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah, I think I read that you, um, you ended up playing Leeds and Reading quite last minute in 2006. What was the yeah. story behind that? Yeah. Yeah, I can't I can't remember who some somebody pulled out and we was we were just basically on like an endless tour, like we were packed to go on tour for like a couple of weeks, but dates just kept getting added because we were pretty hot at the time. So like we're just gonna say, right guys, we'll just do another week, another week, and it ended up being like a really long tour. And um that was in that run where where someone pulled out Red and Leeds, which was huge for us at the time. That was no, but uh, the so we went down and I it was I remember it was a good gig like the both of them were good gigs uh, great festivals yeah yes yeah, it's, it's, I was reading like the whole the whole crowd is chanting kind of thing for the view is on fire and stuff I think I must have been there that year two thousand six yeah, I was yeah um mm. and then yeah obviously like I never link with the Paddingtons is recording with Owen Morris I think. Mm. Yeah. Which you did for both of uh, your first albums, yeah, um, yeah, quite a man experience by all accounts. Yeah, a good, <laughs> a good experience. Like looking in the back, when I was like, "I'm mad." He's got methods to his madness. Like he's a great producer, but yeah, I, it was a crazy time. Like, but um, yeah, one of the best times of my life. Really, yeah, proper rock and roll. That guy, like, like, <laughs> lived it, like, like, he's proper, proper. I think he left the session about four times pretending he quit. And I think one of the times we didn't even notice. And then he came back and he was like, okay, guys, I'm back. And we're like, we're going to the shops or something. He's like, he's... <laughs> uh, was I in Scarborough the first one? Yeah. Yeah. Just did yeah, yeah. And did that kind of suit your style at the time then? A bit, just a bit chaotic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a, it was like a sort of farmhouse that had been rented. The 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 all the gear, everything had been rented in. Um, it was really cool, really cool place. Uh, the Future Heads had just done a record there before. I think that's what gave Owen the idea to do it there. Um, but yeah, it worked out pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. and at what point? Yeah, at what point did you have? Um, might be skipping ahead here, but there's a tour called. Heading for Russia or something, but uh, did you end up like we were playing outside the country pretty quickly type thing? Um, yeah, that heading for Russia tour that was quite later on, but oh, okay, right. That was like a, that was like a sort of big a big European tour where sort of Moscow was like the sort of furthest away place that we were playing. Um, that was a good tour. We done that tour with a band called the Velveteen Saints that are sadly no longer. But we shared the bus in that way. I mean, like we're all like really good friends with them. Like still to this day, they're like top lads. So that was really good. Um, and I uh, sorry, what was other? Yeah, just like if you, how oh, quickly yeah. were you playing outside the country? Yeah. Um, we done we done a gig in Derry in Ireland pretty pretty early on, uh, and then went back and supported the Undertones. All oh, right. A year there, so they, that was our first gigs that we done outside Scotland. Uh, the first gig we'd done down in London, well, in England, any place in England, it was down in London at the the windmill in Brixton. And that was James Endicott's club night. Um, that was with Larrick and Love. Ah, you know, oh, yeah. And great band. Uh, I can't remember when the first time was we went to Europe. I think it was maybe Amsterdam. But yeah, all quite quick. It was all quite quick, really, considering... Mm. And like that amount of touring, is that something obviously it's going to suit you when you're, well, you're still like 19, 20 at the time? 
Hmm. Yeah, a bit roughly. Yeah. I mean, the first two that I would have been nineteen, maybe twenty, and Kyle would be a year younger, and then the rest of us are all the same age as me. So. Right, right. But how long can you keep up that kind of intense, I guess, kind of partying type vibe on the tour? Like, is it easy to easy to keep up? Like, what the uh, what the highs and lows type thing? I don't know. We'll, we'll manage to keep it up fairly well, I think. But the yeah, my advice to would be definitely to have a couple of days off if you know and again keep you, look after your mental health. But we won at the time, like, but yeah, it was just like a whirlwind. Just yeah. Mm, yeah, I think Carl said something like, if he was giving advice to younger bands, it'd be to get a a manager that's going to look after you to tell you when to eat and everything. <laughs> <laughs> um. And then, uh, yeah, so what I was, I was like listening to the difference between the first and second albums. Obviously, the first one goes to number one, which must have been mental. Um, but yeah, what was the, was there any standout differences going into that second album? Obviously, the same producer, like, did you feel pressure or anything like that? Uh, yeah, there was a bit, obviously, trying to like follow up the number one album and stuff. Um, and you've got the label sort of saying, "Wait, songs, guys. These ones aren't hits, and that." And they're like, "Well, okay, we don't know." Like, I mean, whatever I set out to write hits, you know I mean, like, so it's like only. Uh, and I suppose just uh, the old adage that you've got your whole life to prepare for the first album, and then like a year for the second. Definitely felt that. But uh, yeah, did you have songs? Were you writing songs for the second album? You didn't have like um, songs that were left over from the first or anything. No, not really. No, those like those songs on the first record was like all the songs that we had basically, but bar a couple that were pulled. But um, and then we basically just parted for a while, and then people were like, like, when you do the next album, we were like, oh, why? <laughs> oh, uh, so yeah, yeah. it was different. It was more. There was more experimentation in the studio. Let's say on the second record. Whereas the first record we were basically just the songs were all written and had been gigged and toured and we were just sort of captured, trying to just capture the live essence as much as possible. Whereas the second record was a lot more build it up in the studio and let's get strings and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was gonna mention the strings part of it. Um yeah. how did that work? That was pretty cool, actually. Um Owen had a guy across in New York and he basically done them all like like played them all in separately like on his and sent them back over all oh, right okay pretty cool yeah yeah so I've got like five Rebecca's is a great song yeah. enjoying that like you can tell like the difference in the sound between the first and second on that I think and uh Paul and Atina getting involved that is that's when you've had a good relationship with yeah uh, I probably sound like a yeah, great artist Great guy. Um, he was working along the road in Rockfield, and we were in Mono Valley. We had two amazing studios that are only like, like really close to each other in Wales. So I think Kyle went along to his studio first and dragged them back along. Like he came along basically with his whole band, and uh, yeah, and then they recorded that uh, covers. Um, yeah, yeah. That was a cool night. That was a really cool night. Good vibe. And did you have, like, in terms of Scotland, like, um, I feel like with, like, Scotland and Ireland, you know, people are rooting for each other a lot more. Did you have, like, a community of other bands that you'd get on well with type thing? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, especially in, in Dundee, we had, like, uh, there wasn't much. There was. There's, there's always a scene in Dundee. Like there's always bands in Dundee. But the when we were kicking off, there was sort of a scene sort of developed around sort of the doghouse where we were always playing and stuff. And it was it was a good wee scene. Like uh, it was like uh, bands like the Wall, Love It Anna, a band called Dave Question Mark, which was like, <laughs> 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 uh, a band called The Get Downs, um, and the Brogues. But yeah, it was cool. There was a, a lot of bands in that in Dundee around that time. Eh? Yeah, yeah, and then those kind of big moments are like signing the record deal and uh, getting to number one. 
like what were like you say it was a bit of a whirlwind at the time was it hard to get your head around at the time or were you just kind of just enjoying it uh just kind of enjoying it really yeah just kind of taking it every day as it comes at that time like you do when you're that young do you know what i mean you don't really worry about the future of that day just sort of um but yeah i mean going to number one that was crazy yeah yeah <laughs> And Carl kind of mentioned the money. He's like, he was like, there must have been loads of money flying about, but you didn't really see any of it. Is that how you remember it? Uh, kind of, yeah. We 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 took we we just took a wage, and so we all just had the same wage and put all the money in the bank. So we were never sort of like, do you know I mean, it was like you'd done one gig and then it was like thousands and whatever. We just set it up that way. It was a manager's idea. Grant. But I think that's really one of the reasons how we managed to last sort of so long as well. Because it was like we'd sort of had a pot there to sort of get everything sorted kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, do you think that was the best way to get about it? I had enough money in my pocket and was happy, like, just flying about the country playing shows like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, and then... Yeah, was it, is there a story or something behind America? Like you, you played there at some point, but then you couldn't go back or something? Yeah. Yeah, we'd done like a short tour there and it was looking really good. But like uh, same jeans had like chatted really well in college radio and stuff. Uh, and we had a, a North American tour book that had sold out, uh, but we had to pull it because Kyle got caught with drugs. <laughs> right, right. Um, and it took it took was years to get back in. Yeah, I was going to say, when did you eventually get back there to play? Well, it was the tour just after we'd done the fourth album, so I'm not too good at remembering dates and stuff. But it was a good few years before we we managed to get back in. Right. So, okay. Same with Japan. We've done two sold out tours of Japan. It was like our second biggest. Uh, I think it maybe even still is our second biggest territory outside Scotland and England and that. But uh, yeah, we're not allowed back there at the moment either. Still not. Uh, still, there. all right. I think it took McCartney forty years or something to get back in. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking of good segue, actually. Speaking of McCartney, the uh, the producer on the third album. Is he in a? He's in a band with Paul McCartney. Is that right? Yeah, the fireman. Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, youth, yeah, he's in the band with McCartney, yeah. Yeah, how did that come about then with him? Uh, he also produced a new record. Ah, okay, right, cool. Um, I think it was just the, the, the label chose him. The label thought he'd be a good fit. Uh, right. For, yeah, I think he was... They were trying to get a bit more sort of poppy sensibility out, was maybe because he's quite he likes his synths and like sort of layering all the backing vocals and that. So, but uh, yeah, it worked. I like that third record. Yeah, I was enjoying it. I was, uh, listening to like Grace, the video for Grace is good as well. It kind of like captures some of those early times, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, underneath the lights, I was enjoying that. Uh -huh. Um, but where where was that recorded? Or did you did you calm down a bit by that point or not really? Yeah, that was definitely the most chilled album to date to that date. Um, it was recorded in uh, Putney in a studio called Brit Row, which used to be um, Pink Floyd's personal studio. All right. Um, so it's cool, and yes. yeah, it was a lot more chilled affair. It was a lot more chilled affair. It wasn't like just. Constant like drinking and partying while doing a bit of recording. Like we, we, we used to just uh, we got in quite early and stuff. Like the first two records were basically always after like the first week we ended up work getting into like a nocturnal pattern where we'd end up being like up all night making music and then sleeping all day. Whereas that one, it was sort of like strict in at eleven a.m. sort of thing. Well, I say strict. Like some people show up about one, but and then. And then we would just sort of break for food and have a couple of beers and then go back and do work until 11 at night. And then it was sort of a bit of a strict coffee on when we'd finish, you know, and we had weekends off and stuff. So we'd never had that before. It was just sort of straight through. Yeah, so it was definitely a lot more chilled affair. Yeah, yeah. And did you find, like, you were wanting to be a bit more... You wanted to change as a band anyway at that point, like, 
kind of thing in terms of the way you worked. Yeah, I think so. I think it was mostly down to you, sort of, because that's the way he wanted to work in him. Um, but yeah, I think it was definitely time to do that sort of more, have a more professional outlook at that point. Yeah, yeah fair enough. And yeah, I've got to ask you about this forward Russia story, if you do remember it. Um, because it's kind of like first heard it from the guy from Forward Russia, Tom, uh, and then I got Carl's viewpoint. But from what I remember, something like you guys thought they were being a bit weird about sharing a dressing room. Um, then y'all kind of entourage <laughs> managed to get a hold of a load of vegetables and started lobbing them at them, wasn't it? Nah, nah. No, nah, there was no vegetables thrown that night, as far as I could remember. Like, no, nah, there they, they, they were being a bit arsey about sharing the dressing room. It was, uh, and we took the hump at that. So what I remember is while they were on, me and Kyle went and done an acoustic gig in the toilets. <laughs> the crowd was. And yeah, that's, what, that's what I remember. It. <laughs> no vegetables. Yeah, I don't know where I spoiled that one from. It was quite funny. <laughs> not to my knowledge anyway <laughs> yeah yeah um and then yeah you quite uh quickly got another album out after the third album like two albums in two years um mm. and, a, and a switch of labels is that right yeah yeah after the third uh record we got dropped from columbia pretty much instantly signed to cook and vinyl which are a good label. I like it. I like Conway as well. But um, yeah, so the fourth one was on the first one on Cook and Vinyl. We're still with Cook and Vinyl now. Um, we also changed management. We've changed management every album, which I was <laughs> right. Okay. Was a little bit. Um, but yeah, that was a good record. Working with Mike Crossy, who's an absolute amazing and uh, amazing producer. Um. Again, that was a bit more. The, every album has been a bit less crazy than the first two, but the sort of the same kind of thing, sort of working during the day, go for food, come back. Then and that was in the Motor Museum in Liverpool. It used to be called the Big Pink. A lot of people in Liverpool still call it that, but it's been changed to the Motor Museum. And that's a great studio as well. Okay. That was. A, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that record. I really enjoyed working with Mike. Mike Crossy. He's a cool dude. Like. Yeah, he he'd worked with Arts and Monkeys on their demos or something. I read. Yeah, yeah, I think he worked on Favorite Worst. Yeah, I think he'd done the demos, and then he worked. I think he co-produced on Favorite Worst Nightmare. I think, but I yeah, know, yeah. Maybe don't quote me on that, but um, he done Jake Bugs' first record. Uh, he's worked with in nineteen seventy five a lot. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, did I read that? Um... Was it Drew from Baby Shambles that introduced you to Albert Hammond? Is that right? Yeah. 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 I think Albert was saying that he fancied he was looking for a band to produce. And Drew was kind of like, the, the viewer way to do a record kind of thing, they might be quite good. Um, uh, so I, I, that, that's how that came about. Oh, okay. Um, and then Albert came across to meet us in London. And um, I was like, I school. I mean, like, the strokes are like massive to us. Like, so, as not everybody else, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, was it him and uh, was it Gus Oberg? He produced the Strokes third album, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a great guy as well. I like Gus. Caught up with him at Transmit last year, actually. Was it last year, or the year before. I think it was last year. So it was good to see them again. But I guess he's worked on some mega records. So he, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was their like kind of working style like? Was it similar? Did at, at Albert was he going sober at that point or something? Yeah, yeah. Again, yeah, it was quite a. We had a few sort of party nights in that that night. We were all living in this the flat underneath the studio, and we had catering, which was nice. So we never went out all the time. It was kind of that was in Hamburg in a. A studio it was kind of out in the, the like the outskirts of Hamburg kind of thing, and so it was all kind of quite contained within the sort of one building. Again, another amazing studio. It had um, the the desk that John Lennon recorded Double Fantasy on. Was, oh, one, wow. of, one of his records, anyway, and it was pretty cool. 
that's aye, that's a really good really good place to work as well. Yeah, I guess when you hear, when you hear Hamburg, you're thinking Reaperbaum, but I've heard it's a nice place. Other than that, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a good place, Hamburg. Yeah, yeah. And another thing, Carl was saying, like I was saying, how it was, you know, impressive how many albums you managed to get out in that time. When you know a lot of bands maybe find it more difficult, but he was saying that you were quite prolific in terms of songwriting. Were you always kind of on the go with that? Yeah, yeah, we were both we both write quite a lot of songs, like. But I always thought that we were sort of wasted a lot of time. But then looking back on it, everybody's like, "Oh, he's managed to do so much in such a short time." But I always thought, like, at the time, like after the sort of second third record, I thought I sort of thought we took the foot off the gas kind of thing. But apparently not. <laughs> um. No, on paper, like it looks like, yeah. You yeah. hammered them out, basically, I guess. Um, and yeah, like what was there? Why was there a gap after the after the last album? Then what happened there? Just a bit of a break. Ah, uh, yeah, that was the hiatus time. I was uh, well, kind of wanted to do solo stuff. Was sort of the catalyst for the hiatus, really. But uh, looking back on it, I think it done was a bit of good because we'd like we'd quite. We'd, saturated our own sort of market fair bit like do you know what I mean like we the we gigged constantly sort of the year after we'd done the fifth rock, the fifth records and um I think it was good to sort of just have a wee break and take stock and all that yeah, yeah. were you doing I read you were doing some a solo thing called web was it? Aye aye still doing it I just put, I put we've put it on ice just because I, I'm no I'm no multitasker eh, so <laughs> The the view was coming back, um. So I just had to sort of be writing for that and sort of focusing on that. But yeah, hopefully we'll get we've we've got a record there, so hopefully we'll get it recorded soon. I'm going to start rehearsing with the guys, Andy and Gav, um, again soon. But I we've got enough songs there for a record, and it'd be good to get out because we 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 were uh, planning on doing a a UK tour and. We brought out one single, had a UK tour booked, and uh, but the, that was like brought out the single the week before the first COVID lockdown, and the the tour was supposed to be the week after the first COVID lockdown. Right. Okay. And that kind of obviously put a spanner in the works. So, um, and then from there we've done a few gigs last year, but it kind of we're trying to get the ball back rolling now. But but I had to do the the view stuff. And then get that done first. So, but I'm looking forward to getting back in the studio with those guys. Yeah, what's the setup there? Like, how is it say three of you? Yeah, yeah, okay. just me and Andy and Gav, who are the McGonagall brothers, you know, two brothers, and um, they're great human beings, like, um, all the bit. And yeah, just mates, this we've just we've been mates for years, and then I started jamming together, and it worked good, like, yeah. I really oh, okay, cool. So it's cool. We tried to do a sort of self-release single thing. We got offered a couple of deals, and I was kind of like always had it in my head that I'd like to do a sort of self-release punk sort of vinyl record type type vibes. But like, oh, never again, man. It's too stressful. I wish <laughs> it. I wish I'd just let someone else take care of that. But, uh, but hopefully, yeah. hopefully we get something sorted out, and um, when we can, we'll get it released and stuff. Right. Yeah, I've had a few people that have said um, when they've decided to like release her own stuff, it just becomes yeah a bit bit mad just having to do everything for it. Oh, that's mad! I never knew how it was like. What, what this code, that code? You've got to like register this and that. And I was like, oh no, I just thought you just said that we got the records and tried to sell them. But I had to get all these codes in it, and it was nightmare. I like I never registered it for radio either. I had like like uh, DJs up here, like Jim Gillette, like phoning them, so like, here I'm trying to play your record on the radio, but I'm not allowed because you've not filled out this form. Go and fill it out so I can, so I can play it. <laughs> show that. And I'm like, oh, sorry, two, two seconds, and he's like giving me it, and that. It's just like, I'm no, I'm no a good businessman. Like that's what I found out with that experiment. <laughs> <laughs> but I do. I love the band. I'm I hopefully get the thing. I hopefully get uh, the album out at some point because it kind of feels like we were on a sort of. Quite a good trajectory. We've supported the libs. Uh, big oh, right, okay. and stuff. So, Pete to the rescue again. I sort of does it. But that <laughs> was a stick to take. Um, and that was kind of the highlight. And then lockdown happened. 
and then um, well, I'm complaining. I mean, I was a lot of people had a lot of lost lockdowns and just getting a few gigs cancelled. But the yeah, it took the sting out of him. So we'll get we'll get we'll get we'll get back on it definitely. Oh yeah, look, look forward to hearing that. Um, and then yeah, you mentioned kind of like different recording and stuff. Like, how is um writing songs and recording changed over the years? Do you still just write as you used to, or has it changed a little bit? And I've, I've changed up a fair bit, really. Like I used to, I just like used to just be acoustic guitar, notebook, and like a tiny little tape recorder or a little four track or whatever. Whereas uh, I'm a bit of a gearhead nowadays, so I've got like a home studio and like Ableton and uh, keyboards and all that kind of stuff. So I do quite a lot of writing on keyboards and all that kind of stuff. Whereas I used to just sort of do rough, very rough, like just quick recordings in that way, so now I sort of use a bit of technology, so we get a wee drum beat on the go and play along with that and that kind of stuff. It's amazing what you could do with a computer now. But at the same time, I have been thinking, might just have to go back to just acoustic and a little, little recorder, I've done that for a while. Yeah. But apart, yeah. Apart, apart from the actual equipment, uh, the sort of process is just the same, really, just sort of walk around and hope that a lyric pops in your head and write it down and then embellish from there kind of thing yeah and have you ever thought about like producing other bands has that ever been something you've been I have, on? I have i've produced other bands i produced some um, i produced a band called vida of uh, from aloha i've done a i've done a couple of singles with them i worked with a band called bad hombres and um, i've done an ep for them a couple of singles um, and at the moment I'm working on my mate Mark Johnson's record, just uh, the one track on it. That's what I was doing earlier on today. Um, so I, I well, due, during the hiatus, I went and done a degree in audio production because it's something that I've always been interested in. So I went and done that. Um, so that's pretty cool. So yeah, very much so. Yeah, I'd like to have one studio. I'm just not quite there yet. But yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um... Well, how long did that take? About a year or something, the course? It was a two-year degree, so it was like an, it's like an American vibe, like it was trimesters and all that. So it's like two-year degree, so you only got two weeks off in the summer and two weeks off in the Christmas, and then the rest of the time you were in uni. It was a bit of a pity that, again, COVID, like so, because the, the, uni, the uni that I was in, SE, has got like really good facilities and all that. But because of COVID, like we weren't allowed to go in too much, so a lot of it was just online. But right. But I it was good. It was probably one of my favorite experiences like, that I've done. Like, yeah, good like to I left school when I was 16. It was like started as a joiner's laborer, like the Monday after I left on the Friday. And then to go back and do a degree course when I was like 34, 35, or whatever it was, it was quite mad. But it was definitely worth it. Like, I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Mm. Yeah, I guess that's the best way to do it, isn't it? Like, you go good to uni when you actually know what you want to do. <laughs> I, I'd always fancy uni. Like, I used to live just around the corner from the one in Dundee, and I thought, this looks like, this looks the ball, it's one. I used to, like, see everybody just chilling out, drinking on the grass and stuff. <laughs> this looks class. Um, I always quite fancy that. Never ever thought I would actually make it back, but then there you go. You never know what's in the corner, eh? No, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, yeah, in terms of the view, like, I saw you on Soccer M and stuff, um... What's what's Alan McGee's involvement? Is he a manager? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's the manager. Which is cool. I mean, it's, uh, I've actually just uh, turned like all my, my CD collection into like uh, put put them all onto a hard drive before I moved house not a quarter, not a long ago, and it's like I was looking through it and I was like about ninety five percent of this CD collection is like McGee related somehow like hey. <laughs> just you know what I mean? For Oasis to the Planet Ends to the Hives, like to I don't know, or just all the other cast we were watching now. It was like it's mega, so so that's pretty cool. Um, that came about. I just uh, I emailed him. I had his email because um, we were supposed to be doing one of his charity gigs a few years back, but it ended up not happening. But I always had his email. We didn't have management. And I knew that we were starting to think about getting back together. So I emailed him and he was like, yeah, he just like phoned me back the same, like about 10 minutes later and was like, I'm up for that. Like, I'll meet you in Liverpool. 
So we went down and met him in Liverpool. And um, yeah, yeah, he's a manager. Along along with Jamie. Um, yeah. Okay. Did you, did you have like an existing relationship with Alan McGee anyway? Or not really? No. No, oh, not, right, okay. no, met him a couple of times, but not really, no. Always sort of wanted to work with him for just like just purely because he's worked with like so many, like my favourite bands kind of thing. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. And then yeah, what was kind of the catalyst for getting back together? Like uh was it always gonna happen? Did you, did you know it was gonna happen at some point? Yeah, yeah, it was always the plan at some point to get back together and then so the email started flying about sort of like when I was at my last sort of just going to the last bit of uni and I was just like I'm up, I'm up for it but I'll just need to finish this off first to kind of like be in the view and like be on the tour bus doing essays and shit like so <laughs> you're, going have, you're going to have to wait until I'm finished it. so with the waited until I was finished my uni and then we basically just started sort of sending them demos to each other and that kind of stuff and then we went over to Spain to Youth studio. He's got a studio in Spain and really nice studio in Spain. And uh recorded it there. Oh yes. Yeah. So how does that work? Then he say you're on cooking van, are they kind of fun that recording kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, they yeah. Get, you just give you an advance to go and make the records and some money for pro one. I don't I'm not really too sure to be honest, mate. I'm not like <laughs> just minded at all, but I know they gave us a decent advance to go and make it and and they, they they give you money for public uh, for, for not publishing for publicity uh, what's it called marketing and that PR and yeah, all yeah yeah like the social paying the social media guys and that kind of stuff um yeah they're cool label for cooking by now I like them I like them a lot they've got some cool acts so yeah I think I've spoke to a few people that have been on there I think the subways are on there at some point and might mm-hmm. still be or something yeah yeah um but, uh, and... the makers you know ah uh, okay right. Yeah. yeah, do you have a good relationship with people? I think I saw you were involved in some kind of super group with them at some point with like Reverend and the Makers, and I think Drew was in there as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved it, I loved it I but Bob did a loads, John. Um, yeah, just on, just on around festivals, and I think there was like there was a night and when we, all, we were all like jumping up on the stage at one point. I can't remember exactly when that was. <laughs> There's been some messy nights when, like, when certain people are together, eh? but um, definitely. Eh? I remember he, mar- he, he, he married me and my missus at uh, the thirty the thirty year anniversary of the Victoria Park Clash gig and stuff. Just like it's a laugh, obviously. But, but, <laughs> he's good, good band, like. Yeah, I've, I've been like following him on Twitter recently. He's um, he really goes for it. He's been doing loads of like playing at people's houses and stuff. On have you seen it? Yeah, yeah, he's good on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a lot of fun to be fair. Yeah, um, it's 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 good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he ask? He's asking people to get involved with that one. He with uh, was it letter to my letter to myself yeah, or something? That, yeah, former twenty-one year old self. Or something. Yeah, yeah, it's quite an interesting yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah, it was it. Um, then I was listening to your song. Shoveling his hands, which I was enjoying. Um, is that something that came back recently? Is it was it one of those songs that's been like around for the last few years? Uh, Try to think when I wrote that. Um, no, I think it's like I, I wrote all the tunes for the all my tunes for the the new record I wrote fairly recently once I'd finished uni. So it must say it couldn't be too old, but it was one of the first ones. Some did a lot different on the demo. It got slowed down a lot in the studio and that, which I wasn't too happy about at first, to be honest, but I got vetoed. But um I'm starting to I'm starting to grow, it's starting to grow on me a bit now. So it's got a cool corally vibe, man. I like the coral, so no, I was enjoying it, yeah. Is it is it coming out next month? The record? Yeah, uh, the album, yeah. I think so, yeah. It's been moved moved around a couple of times. Okay. But uh yeah, I can't remember the date like off the top of my head. But um, yeah, like I said, I'm rubbish at stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we were in the group chat, like guys, get this on the socials. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I'll just uh, just like ask you some of those songs that uh, some of the songs, some of the questions I sent you. Um, and yeah, like is there is has there been a high point? I guess there's been a, quite a lot of high points for you guys, on not there? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the whole baby shambles thing that we talked about earlier from start to finish, like when we first met them to the end of the first tour type thing to on still ongoing is like a highlight. Um, the, uh, the album going to number one, was, that was a highlight. Um, but one that always stands out is uh, the first, our well, first appearance at Team the Park was like mega. Or like, just like, couldn't believe it. Like, we were playing on the tea break stage, it was like the unsigned stage. And like people, like, people couldn't get in the tent. It was just like absolutely mobbed and like everybody absolutely went for it. Just by was being like, we were like the most local band there kind of thing. And I always just remember thinking, that's amazing. Like, that's like our Glastonbury, like, so it's like, like that's like what you dream about, like being done Dundee, you know, it was like 20 minutes up the roads. That was a, a big highlight, but yeah, there's been a lot. Working with Owen Morris, it's a huge Oasis fan, so to be. Um, yeah, loads. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was reading, I think, the person who, who runs uh, Team the Park, he was like, oh, the, the view can play every year for me or something. <laughs> is that stopped now? Yeah. Yeah, the closest thing now is Transmit. Yeah. I love watching the live videos from there. They're always absolutely mad. Yeah. Yeah, we're, 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 that's, the, that's the next gig that we've got. Transmit. Ah, excellent. It's good. There's no campsite on the hand, which was sort of one of the sort of legendary parts of Team the Park, but um, it's a good festival. It's just around the corner from the house. So oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. What are the uh, what are the best festivals to play abroad? Um, I suppose there's loads these days, isn't there? Yeah, it's been a while since we've been over, but I mean, um, we call it Benicassim, but what is it really called? Is it? I can't even remember the real name of it. But the one that's in Benicassim, that's great. Yeah, BBK is it? <clears throat> um, Pupil Pop in Belgium. That was always one that I loved to go to. It's quite a sort of Always kind of had a sort of sort of heavier rock rock kind of feel to it. Like I've seen like the Stooges and that there and stuff. And I really like playing that one. The Fezzies in Europe are a lot more like chilled out. And, like there's no sort of as many people like rushing yet about health and safety, this, health and safety, that. And that kind of <laughs> stuff. they're always like, hey man, enjoy yourself. It's cool. And the backstages are always amazing. So quite often get a pool in them and that. Eh? And the other one that we always like to play is Lowlands in just outside Amsterdam. That's I have heard of that one, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I remember we went, he was went to Ben in 2009, and um, it was like a massive, well, it was like a hurricane type thing, and uh, all the stages got closed. But me and, me and my mates managed to like to make the most of it and got backstage, and there's like, yeah, there was a pool and everything and free drinks. Bit of a bit of an insight into what you guys must have gone through. <laughs> we, we were there that year. Oh, really? Yeah, Oasis played. Yeah, it's ace. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, that was one, one of the last ever gigs, I suppose. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, did you have a good... Uh, I've heard a few stories about you and them. Did you have a good relationship with those guys? Yeah, yeah, they've always been really nice to us. Like, I and just... They were they're both quite vocal at, at the beginning, like, sort of... Like, big was up on the radio and in the NME and stuff, which was pure mega at the time. Like, yeah, well, still is. Just, uh, um, yeah, I... Good guys. Yeah, I saw a story about him. Did Noel Gallagher walk into one of your recording sessions once or something? Yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. Yeah, the very first time, well, did you see what, remember I told you that we had an EP that yeah. was like first, the first ever record that we made properly. Um, we made it in Scotland, a studio called The Teapot. But uh, we went to Metropolis in London to master it, which was one of our first trips down there. And no, Gallagher was just in the cafe when we got there. And we were like, what? So we just like ran across to him. I was like, no, 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 how's it going? How's it going? How's it going? Come and listen to an album. Uh, come and listen to an EP. Come. And he was like, all right. Yeah. And they just came inside and listened to it. And he was just like, so we were like, what the hell is going on, man? And he was like, ah, cool stuff, guys. I keep catches in a bit. And then ever since then, I, every time you see him, he's always like, all right, guys, how's it going? On? Can I? <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yeah. And yeah, just want to finish on then. Uh, well, maybe a couple, but is there anything you do differently? I don't know. 
It's a hard one, that, isn't it? Because you never know what goes on if you do it in a different one. Uh, one thing I do regret is missing out on all the fancy hotel breakfasts that I never made it down for because it was too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I think about it. Like, oh, I've got them fancy breakfasts. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's a good shout, to be fair. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe at least there's some in the past. I'll try to just focus on the, the now can. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I was going to ask as well, like, uh, say if the view was starting out these days, like, how how do you think it would be different for you guys that watched challenges do you think you'd have? Mm, I don't know, I don't know. I suppose, like, the whole sort of rock and roll debauchery things, like, sort of frowned upon a bit more nowadays, isn't it? Whereas at the time we were sort of praised for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah. I mean, it must be, I don't know, really. I don't know. I mean, I, well, yeah. The fact that, like, you've basically, which I think is quite unfair on young bands, like, you've got to basically be good on social media before anybody will pick you up. Mm. I can't, I mean, like, I can't, like, like, we were, like, never very good on social media. That Like, it was sort of always went over our heads type thing and, like, so, like, yeah, that might have been a sort of problem for us. Um, yeah, it's like, must be a a shame. yeah, it must be a distraction a bit, like, having to do all that. Yeah, and a lot of, like, you know, people I've found, like, good artists that are quite introverted, do you know what I mean? And that's, like, why the management and the label, like, sort of markets them and they do the music type thing, eh? whereas if you've got them do it both, I think some, some, good, some good artists will fall through the cracks just because they're not very good on Instagram or whatever, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's also nice to have a bit of mystery about a band as well, without having to like post everything you're doing, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. It's like like uh, like Oasis, they were like that, weren't they? It was like you are these guys, like, was, <laughs> yeah. like whereas now it's like you know what every band's had for their breakfast, and what their fan they're driving in, and where they're going. And, uh, yeah, it's odd, isn't it? Um. Yeah, that's brilliant, mate. Cheers for that. Oh, and nice one, mate. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll come come see you at some point, I reckon, over summer. Are you playing how many gigs are you doing over summer? Quite a lot. We've got a few in. We've got a few in. Um, hey, the next time we're down south is for Shine On Festival, I think. Are you going to that? Okay. Don't know where that is. No, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, but yeah, yeah, I've got a few, I've got a few. Yes, I'll keep an eye out then. But um, yeah, I'll probably post that this week, mate. So I'll uh, I'll give you a shout. And we've we've got a, a, a an English tour in November as well. Ah, okay, a nice one. It's quite a few dates, so maybe catches at one of them. Yeah, yeah, definitely, mate. Sounds good. <laughs>